All right. So, for those of you who don't know who I am, which is probably none of you, um, I'm Jacob Rufa. I'm going to be talking about building and consuming a RESTful API. Um, I help organize this group and uh, try and contribute to some of the other groups in town. Um, this talk has been given a couple of times here in varying stages, uh, mostly unfinished. This one I can assure you is finished, or at least has the appearance thereof. Um, before I dive into the talk though, I want to say that uh, this weekend, Saturday the 18th, I will be giving the same talk at Chicago Code Camp, which is uh, a one-day dev event uh, in Chicago, actually. In prior years, it's been in Lake County. But if you go to chicagocodecamp.com, you can go and register and join us there because it will be a fun time. Um, also, next month, we're going to be uh, wrapping up our Pastebin series uh, with a little bit of look into front-end tooling um, by way of some CSS preprocessing and JavaScript linting. That was something that we kind of looked at um, with the first of the series, but it didn't really, I don't know, it wasn't very cohesive. Um, so we're going to be looking at that and then um, kind of doing like a wrap-up, like what we went over throughout the course of the series and looking over how that went, getting some feedback, and uh, hopefully um, doing another cool project from there. Um, and then June, we will be having Mike Owens present on uh, web performance basics, um, just kind of giving a very high level overview of like performance and how you can improve your site. Um, so that said, um, thanks to Rand and Lyons for uh, allowing us to host here at the Agri Lab. And this is building and consuming a RESTful API. Um, so yeah, uh, who am I? I'm Jacob Rufa. I just told you that. Um, that kind of makes this slide a little bit repetitive, but there's a cool picture of me and my family. Um, so what is a RESTful API? Um, as most commonly implemented, a RESTful API is a predictable and useful way to transmit data from a server to any number of clients using HTTP. Um, it is, I mean, in programming we have this idea of APIs that we program against uh, methods that do things um, that allow us uh, to access and manipulate data um, in different and useful ways. So a RESTful API is really no different, um, except it's an API that's defined against uh, the HTTP specification. Why should you care? The RESTful convention is used throughout the internet to provide data that powers many of our daily interactions. Um, if you've used any app on a, any cell phone, chances are you've used a RESTful API. Um, a lot of web services that you're used to uh, using anymore are a lot of times built on RESTful APIs because it allows them to provide um, one data source to power multiple different applications. So what is REST exactly? REST stands for Representational State Transfer, and it is an architectural style uh, defined by Roy Fielding in his dissertation, consisting of a coordinated set of constraints applied to components, connectors, and data elements within a distributed hypermedia system. This was Wikipedia's older uh, definition of REST, like. I don't know, six or eight months ago. I like it. I think it, uh, I think it really nicely encapsulates what REST is. Um, so in that definition, it talked about constraints. Um, as programmers, again, you know that everything that we build has uh, constraints set upon it. Uh, there are limits to what and how you do things. Otherwise, everything, I think, would be like this giant amorphous, in unintelligible blob. Um, so one of the constraints is that of client and server. Uh, the client simply does not know how the server stores its data, and the server doesn't care how the client presents it. Um, we're used to, to terms like separation of concerns, uh, which is one of the principles that I think a lot of us adhere to in programming. Um, this uh, kind of brilliantly executes that um, separation of concerns. Um, Clients can be as far ranging, like I mentioned earlier, from like a, a cell phone app to a web app to uh, something that uh, an end user never sees, but still grabs data from the same source in order to aggregate it in a certain way. Um, and the server, likewise, doesn't care what client consumes it because all it's responsible for is spitting out data or 
taking it in, as the case may be, depending on what endpoint you hit. Um, another uh, uh, criteria is uh, that it must be stateless. Every request must stand on its own and contain all the necessary information to complete that request. Um, so when you make a call to a certain endpoint on an API, you would expect that uh, everything you need um, is encapsulated within that request body. Um, along the same lines is the idea of idempotence, um, which basically means, it's a really fancy term that's from mathematics originally, that means given the same input, one should expect the same result. So every time you hit a certain endpoint on an API with a certain set of parameters, you are going to get the exact same result every single time. Um, that's one of the, the foundational aspects of a RESTful API. Uh, another one of the constraints is that uh, it is cacheable. Uh, the server must define the ability to cache or not where applicable, um, which basically is a way for um, the server to handle, uh, to, to, to handle what data should or should not be cached um, so that the client doesn't have to worry about it. If the server says, hey, this is cached, this is the, the cache expiration, um, you know, that's one less thing that the client has to worry about further uh, encapsulating that request um, and kind of going back to the principle of uh, stateless. Um, everything that the request needs is within that one, that request. Um, another constraint is that of a uniform interface. Uh, the data interface must be general enough that many clients could use it. Um, so with this constraint, uh, it might be easy to misconstrue the definition here. Uh, what we're talking about is not um, the, the format the data is transmitted in, like uh, CSV or JSON or XML or any other data interchange format. Um, it is with regards to uh, the way that the data is organized. Um, like the access, uh, the, the point of access, the, the, the resource naming, uh, the resource interfacing. Um, so like um, if you're at uh, the URL um, google.com slash search slash enter your parameters here, like that is the interface to a RESTful API. Does that make sense? So we have here a bunch of shipping containers because that's sort of relevant. Um, it's relevant because of resource orientation. Um, the idea behind the constraint of resource orientation is that you should construct your resources such that they are representative of the way you want your user to manipulate them. Um, so the idea behind the shipping containers uh, was that, you here for the web devs meetup? Yeah. Come on in. Um, the idea behind the, the shipping containers as kind of an analog here is that, um, again, these resources that we're talking about are accessible uh, via the endpoints uh, as I described within a URL. Um, so those being the resources, that's, um, I guess, a way of, of containing uh, different data as you would expect it to be. Um, and uh, you would want to organize uh, the way that you access it via that URL structure to be um, representative of the way you want a user to be able to manipulate it. Um, Hadios, uh, kind of like an evil Cheerios. Uh, it's an acronym that's really terrible, um, but it stands for Hypertext as the Engine of Application State. This is probably one of the most uh, misunderstood and unimplemented parts of any RESTful API. Uh, it's something that is really foundational to the idea of building a RESTful API, but uh, something that no specification uh, of data interchange really uh, takes into account, at least no ratified specification. Um, some, something along those lines would be the JSON HAL specification. Um, or the idea of hypermedia APIs, if you've ever heard that term before. Um, some people use hypermedia APIs and RESTful APIs interchangeably. Um, JSON HAL uh, is an extension of the JSON format that was designed to account for the Hadios principle within REST. Um, 
but it never, it hasn't so far anyway, I should say, made it past uh, W3C ratification. It was at one point up for nomination as part of the W3C spec, but uh, it's still kind of hanging out there. So developers are really left uh, to their own devices to define uh, what hypermedia inside of a RESTful application means. Um, and as such, there's a lot of dissenting opinion there. And another constraint of a RESTful API is that of a layered system. The client cannot tell whether or not it's connected to the server or any intermediary. Um, for example, a load balancer or a shared cache. Um, again, this has to do, uh, it's, it's very intertwined in, in the idea that a RESTful API is stateless. Um, uh, having cacheability, um, the, the server is the server, and the client is the client, and they're totally separate. And the client doesn't care where it's getting the data, it just cares that it's getting the data in this format, right? And the last constraint uh, is that of code on demand, which is optional. Um, when Fielding wrote his dissertation, um, code on demand was kind of thought of in terms of uh, Java and being able to dynamically serve up different pieces of an applet that would extend the, the, the running app that, uh, that you're using to consume the API. Um, so kind of a modern analog would be um, serving up an extra JavaScript and injecting it asyn asynchronously into the running process. So I'm going to take a quick break here because uh, that was kind of a lot to digest. Um, does anybody have any questions so far about the constraints of a RESTful API, about any of the ideas presented in there? Um, where would you find the specifications for HAL? Uh, for, for HAL? I actually provide a uh, link at the end of my presentation. Okay. So, and my slides are available online, so you can All right. go there. Um, everybody else? You all good with me so far? You understand? RESTful APIs. So you get it now. All right, now that we know the constraints of RESTful API is built under, how can we implement this? I think this is probably the most important part because you can speculate on something all day long. You can understand it and understand it and you just need to build it. Um, so uh, a little bit of background. Fielding, uh, Roy Fielding, when he wrote his dissertation, was, I believe, working at uh, the Apache Foundation. Uh, he was really instrumental in bringing each, the HTTP spec uh, to the world. Um, and as such, he designed uh, his idea of RESTful APIs around the HTTP specification. So uh, RESTful API should use HTTP methods by default. Um, get, post, put, and delete, and all the others uh, are your friends. There are lots of different things that you can do with uh, these methods on any given resource. Um, and I think it's a really powerful paradigm. Um, so you can kind of see here the screenshot that I took of uh, a curl request uh, using the git uh, method to some URL. Um, JSON as a data format, I think, is the thing that has caught on the most. Uh, JSON's not required for an API to be RESTful, but it's a very simple data interchange format um, that I think is, is a lot easier uh, to, to use as a developer. It's a lot easier to read as a human than XML might be. Um, but you could certainly use XML, you could use YAML, you could use you know whatever data interchange format you want. I chose to use JSON because it's easy to parse and simple to construct. So here we have a, a small JSON representation of an object. Uh, simple URI construction. Um, this is kind of related to uh, resource orientation, like I was talking about before. Um, you want to build your URIs to make use of all available methods. It's kind of coming full circle now. It's hard for me to explain uh, what resource orientation really means without talk talking about the application thereof. But the best example would be that uh, url.com slash slides is a resource that can be called with git or post to different effects, or any other verb for that matter. Um, you should be able to um, verb any resource um, and get back some 
result. Yo dog, I heard you like RESTful APIs. So I built a RESTful API to present on RESTful APIs. So in case you hadn't guessed so far, this presentation actually is built on a RESTful API. Um, I can edit this slide and be like meme here and submit and wow so uh, refresh the page and it's still there because this presentation is dynamic. Um, I built a simple RESTful API to be able to um, get put post and delete um, all my slides. Um, thought it was the easiest way to kind of drive the point home uh, and really talk about implementation um, from a more experienced perspective. So what I used to build this application was uh, PHP and the SLIM framework. SLIM is a micro framework you might have heard of. Um, really, I could have used Silex, Epiphany, um, I could have used Laravel or um, uh, Taylor Otwell actually just uh, announced today that uh, Lumen, his new PHP micro framework uh, that uses the Illuminate components uh, used in Laravel. Um, so, I mean, I've actually tossed around the idea today of rewriting uh, my whole API in Lumen because, well, that would be cool. It would be another thing to learn. Um, but the reason I chose Slim was because it allows you to match routes to HTTP methods simply to serve an API. Uh, for example, you can call the get method, which is synonymous with the HTTP get method, on your app, um, give it your resource, which is slash slides, and then do stuff on that resource. So here, we're just retor returning an array of slides ordered by ID. So pretty straightforward, right? Um, but you can do other things. You can post to slides. Notice I'm using the same resource, but changing the method. Um, again, this is important because uh, HTTP allows you to do multiple different things with any given resource. Um, so it, it's really versatile in the way um, that it allows you to, to manipulate the application. So here we are uh, hopefully sending uh, title, subtitle, body, byline, all to the slides uh, table and storing that away only for it to be served up later. Um, this is a screenshot of the actual application. I would not recommend you ever build an application like this because it's not secure. I didn't really sanitize my data as well as I probably should have. I'm not caring about validation. It's a proof of concept. It's an idea. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, just a, a simple implementation of this RESTful idea. So. Again, in accordance with uh, HTTP verbs, we have this put method. Um, the put method is a little bit different because we're uh, adding the ID of the slide to this request. So we're requesting slides slash ID instead of just slides. Um, and what's, what that's allowing us to do is modify that slides resource because put as an HTTP verb uh, means that you are going to be modifying a resource, not creating it, not getting it, not deleting it, you're modifying it. Um, the verbs are very intentional. Um, and then delete, because you know you need to delete stuff sometimes. And uh, so I've also created uh, a front end, which is this presentation itself, uh, using JavaScript and Backbone.js. Uh, Backbone uh, was designed with the idea of consuming RESTful APIs from the ground up, so it allows uh, you very simply to manipulate any API resources. Um, Backbone uses a very traditional uh, model view controller uh, construction. Um, so here we have our slide represented as a Backbone model, and again, you're noticing the same things, first title, title, subtitle, body, byline, those are all the fields that we're storing in our table. Um, kind of circling back to uh, the, the, the earlier slide where we were talking about, um, well, here I can just uh, go back to it. Where we're talking about this client and server idea. 
uh, client does not know how the server stores its data, and the server does not care how the client presents it, right? So what that means for us here <laughs> is that we're consuming this with a backbone application. It could be jQuery. It could be uh, a bunch of curl requests inside of another PHP application. Uh, the server side of it could be written in any other language. It doesn't have to be PHP. It doesn't have to, the data doesn't have to be stored in a MySQL database. Those are just conventions I chose because they're things that I'm used to, and it made sense for me as a developer. Um, if you like to write your applications in Go or Ruby or .NET, you know, those are things that you can use too to create uh, API applications as well as the clients for, that consume those applications. Um, the collection is just a collection of models. Uh, it's very simple, but here's where you put your business logic that relates to consuming the API. Um, here we're basically just adding all the slides and then rendering and appending them to the presentation. And then the view is where all the stuff happens that just got called here. So this uh, render and append node on the new slide view in that add slide method is the same render and append node that you see in the view here. So questions? That was way, way too fast. Well, I wanted to go back to when you talked about the, the cats initially. <laughs> sure. Um, so you, you mentioned there that the server is responsible for how do you put it, uh, determining what data is cacheable. And now is that how are you saying then the server is the one that's caching it, or going back to get it from the data source originally, or are you saying that it's pushing forward information about the cacheability of this object? Both. Okay. Both. The idea, the intent there is to remove. Um, remove any responsibility from the client to have to deal with caching. The client should know if it's cached, it should know how it's cached so that it can fetch a clean result when that cache time is expired. But that's not on the client to determine when that stuff happens, it's on the server. So the server ideally is serving up data as fresh as possible, but caching it where it's appropriate. So wouldn't it be on the client yeah, I mean, that would be a form of, of handling the cache. So your, your client then does need to know how to handle those headers, otherwise they're going to make requests every time. <clears throat> yeah, I suppose so. The way that I understood it, like I said, is the intent is that the client has to do um, the least amount of work interpreting the request as possible. The client should have everything that it needs, excuse me, from the request in the, inf in the response that it gets back. Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't really hurt the application if the client over-requested stuff if they just ignored the, right. the fact that it's cached. Right. Yeah, so that's an interesting so, distinction. Is that what you were getting at, Ryan, yeah, so I mean that was that was a confusing piece because from from one interpretation you're mentioning that the server's taking care of all that. Mm -hmm. That's one way to interpret what, what was on the description, and the other way was that it's taking care of giving the cacheable and you know the information to the client. So I was I was kind of unsure as to exactly how that was intended. So Gotcha. Um, yeah, I suppose it would be left up to the developer, um, but like I said, the intent is for the client to, to just know how to handle it without having to, to struggle to interpret that. So, um, because, like I said, a RESTful API could be consumed by more than just a browser, so, I mean, those headers may or may not be appropriate um, given that. Um, I guess if you're designing an API that is only supposed to be consumed by a browser, you can rely on certain aspects of the standards to, to be able to enforce things through, like headers, for instance. Um, but if you're not, yeah. 
So it would be at the developer's discretion. So um, REST as an idea is, is really bad. It's just an idea. It's a set of uh, suggested constraints, um, as seen with the, the, the Hadios um, and the, the JSON-HAL specification. Um, you know, uh, it was designed around the idea of hypermedia, being able to link between resources and, and use that to its advantage. But that suggestion in, in the way that RESTful APIs are commonly implemented isn't really taken to heart, I don't think. So I guess the onus would be on the developer again. I remember when you brought up the original idea of the slideshow and the, and the RESTful APIs quite a while back. So yeah, I mean, it started out. I, I got I really interested. Kind of going to go that route here. When we started this yeah, thing. yeah, I absolutely did. Uh, I, I really got interested in, in learning about uh, RESTful applications because it's such a fundamental part of the way that we consume the internet anymore. Um, like if you're wanting to integrate with any other external service, chances are you're doing so in, in the form of consuming a RESTful API. So um, it's something that's, that's pretty fundamental um, for us as developers. Um, so um, I apologize for speaking too fast. That's totally weird of me. What's up? All right, so I have a question. Yep. It goes to your, uh, I suppose your, your route naming. Sure. So you can basically call it anything so mm -hmm. there's no, like, Jeff Therese says you should, you should, you know, your API should have these naming conventions. No. Uh, for post no. Or anything like that. There's, there's nothing like that. So you can use any of the verbs on any of your resources. That's, that's the constraint. Um, the, the, the suggestion there is that you name your resources appropriately as to how your users want to use them. So, like in this instance, my resources are named slash slides slash ID of the slide, right? Because that makes sense because I just want to get a long list of slides and if I need to manipulate a slide, I just append the ID. And that makes sense for how I need, I'm consuming this application. Um, other applications might be and, and are much more intensive in the number of resources that they provide, uh, the, the, the sub-resources and uh, the way that they allow the user to manipulate the application through those resources. Um, one thing that I would suggest strongly against, and, and this is something that was really common until a few years ago and it started to kind of go away, um, people were really fond of just using the Git resource because it's so widely available. It's what we use for you know, everyday HTTP access, we use Git. Uh, when we use forms, we use post. But those aren't the only two verbs. You have a wealth of verbs available to you. Get, post, put, and delete are by no means the only verbs out there. Um, so if you're curious about building a RESTful API, I would suggest looking at all the HTTP verbs and what their intent is. And then based on that intent, you can start to find a, uh, the, the most appropriate way for your application to use them. Does that, make, does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, I just run into this issue where, you know, you're like, well, should I do, you know, slide update or slide ID or, you know, update slash slide, right. and I wasn't sure if there was anything that... Right. Well, that so ideally works. you wouldn't put actions into your resources, right? Because you, you, you called your resources on those methods, on those actions. So your resources are more like pointers to your data structure. Gotcha. Yeah. Did I yeah. Gotcha. Better answer. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Another thing too, um, you know, if you look at some applications, I'm not going to mention Magento or anything, but if you <laughs> if you look, sometimes you'll see, uh, you know, the, the nice long URL, which is obviously some indication of what kind of uh, you know resource it's dealing with, and then the parameter list is really ridiculously, you know, slash one as the ID, slash, and then it goes with a bunch of other parameters <laughs> for multi-parameter type things. Is, is there any um, guidance from that, or are we, should we be thinking along the lines uh, of 
the unique ID and then everything else is part of the request. Kind of see what I'm saying? So it's a, yeah. a multi-parameter lookup, for instance. Uh, yeah. Um, it seems like those, what do you, the, the, those, uh, gosh, what do you call that? Resource URIs would be mm -hmm. really ridiculous to try to code. Yeah, um, I mean, we can mitigate a lot of that with the, the way that we handle dynamic applications. I mean, like in the um, in these methods here, you know, uh, I can take slash slide slash ID. I could add a bunch of other parameters onto the end of that and just give my method that much more information, right? So, like, those, uh, but it doesn't have to be like that. Like, slide slash ID slash, you know, do something um, could be another resource. And that would be described under its own method, not necessarily under this. So I guess it's up to you as the developer to sort of structure what makes sense, um, again, for how you want to consume it. You don't want, the thing that you don't want is uh, um, opacity in your application. Uh, the request should be very self-described. Um, you should be submitting to a URI that makes sense for the action that you want to take on your data. So, okay, this put verb, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've got get, straightforward put. Do you send anything with that request besides just the URI there? Is that gen or is that just post is the only one that does that? No, here we're sending... Uh, the, ah, the body okay. right here. Right. Um, uh, so you see slide, uh, we're JSON decoding the body. So the body is a JSON representation of that slide. Um, and then we're taking from that the different pieces of information and setting them on the, uh, on the data. Totally overlooked that line. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, so you, you would send information along with the request. Um, but uh, I would say try to include as much as is relevant in, in the URI. Right. Um, from a, from a, a larger overview perspective. Is there any guidance uh, you know, in terms of best practices for patching? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would think that, you know, like most things, that would be at your discretion. I haven't seen anything in particular that speaks to that. I've seen it done both ways. Um, you know, similarly to how you would do something like this. You know, if you wanted to add a filter into your request body instead of into the URI, you know, that's it's six of one half a dozen of the other. I think that um, pagination in the URI is a little bit more self-explained. You know, if you've got uh, um, a number there that makes sense. Um, but yeah. I, I haven't seen anything specifically on that, no. no. I thought I saw uh, just recently that Gmail's API um, passes in a, uh, like a pagination variable. Tax it up again, so if you want to use that, you just kind of send that variable back in. And you might get your next, your next data set instead of, you know, having, so I don't know if that's what I did. I don't know if it can help you. Yeah, I think they're just making it up as they go along, just like <laughs> us. Yeah, you, you just see so many bad REST APIs out there. That, you know, yeah. Want one place to work, like lay out. Um. But they, you know. Yeah. I guess you just decide on one. Yeah, I would. I would say that. Uh, I would take hints from an API that, as a developer, is pleasant to use for you. Um, I would say that if uh, uh, an API follows uh, at least, 
you know, somewhat loosely. Uh, the constraints mentioned by uh, Roy Fielding in his dissertation, you know, um, that it's it should be considered restful. The biggest one of those is um, resource orientation, and then um, you know, making use of the HTTP um, protocol, hypertext protocol. Protocol. Yes. Now, supposing um, you had a pre-existing REST system that was developed by somebody else and you want to wrap it around it so that it's more programmatic, uh, what would be the best way to go about, how should I say this, procedure-wise, or at least um, philosophy-wise, as to current instructing such a wrapper? Um, I don't know, that sounds an awful lot like a client. Um, okay. Like, because in the, in the in this case, in this case, I'm making I got this database system that already has this um, REST system in place, mm -hmm. but it's intended to use like an actual type it into a browser and get stuff on the screen. Mm -hmm. But I want to be able to, to take those those APIs not the, the URLs, the URIs, mm -hmm. the URIs, mm -hmm. and be able to turn those into like functions where you're sticking parameters in a parameter list. Gotcha. I mean, I guess you would just build an API that uh, uses another API as its data source. Like, that's one of the beautiful things about this, right? You don't, uh, it doesn't matter what your data source is. What matters is how you're constructing um, these resources yeah. that make sense to the consumer of the API. Yeah, so well, I guess, you, what I'm, guess what I'm saying is, what would you do first? Uh, first, I would try and modify that other API that you're using directly, if you have the ability to do so. If you okay. don't, if you don't, then make that a part of uh, a part of your own data source. You know, okay. use that use that in aggregate with a local database, whether you're you know downloading it from. Uh, downloading the data from that other API um, and storing it off on some uh, remote procedure, or if you're, you know, actually manipulating it right. on every request, um, that would be your call. But you know, an API that wraps another API that is consumed by, you know, that's that's pretty crazy. Um, <laughs> well, it's not, an interesting thought, though. Yeah, because it's like there's this, yeah, the database system is called OrientDB. Hmm. It was created by somebody else. And they created a output, a get, and all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, right now, it does. Some, for some languages, wrapper still exists, and for others, it doesn't. For one that it doesn't, or is currently in its infancy, mm -hmm. I would like to be able to construct <laughs> one. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, like I said, as far as an algorithm of going about constructing this, oh, yeah. what do you think? Will you can you give me some guidelines? Algorithmically, I, I, I wouldn't know. I mean, I, I wouldn't know without being able to look at you know what you're talking about. Okay. Um, but I've not, I've honestly not heard of anything doing that in particular. Um, I think I see what he's getting at, though, because yeah. you find a lot of APIs. You, you go, uh, you know, off the top of my head, like say. GitLab or even Git, you know, they'll say, oh, here's a predefined PHP wrapper for the API, so you can yeah. use these PHP methods that conveniently do all of the, the fun stuff behind it right. for you, and you just make normal PHP calls. So I think right. he's trying to get at that. And I think right. what you need to do with that is basically go through and find out what the API has uh, for, for the resources, like we talked about here, what you can do with the API, right. and then sort of map those out you know, you just it's it's a it's a lot of footwork, right? You just have to get in there and start saying, okay, well, this is how I'm going to make the calls and how you're going to pass the data back and forth. But yeah, that's going to be a lot of just manual right in there and yeah, doing the first one and then do the second one, and by that time you'll know that right because because yeah, because I'm running into situations about testing mm -hmm. because with the database, obviously some stuff you only do once. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to be doing testing, you have to be able to do it repeatedly. So it's like undo what you did before. Right. And that means da da. You can see where this. You see where this is going. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I would think it would be no different from building any other client against a, a, any other API um, in that instance. And uh, as far as testing goes, and 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 running 
uh, running things more than once. Again, it would be no different than um, you know removing uh, a row from your database and adding it back in and removing it okay. and adding it back in because uh, right. with the idea of idempotence, um, you get to you get the ability to make these requests over and over and over again, and you you should be getting if if the, the API that you're consuming is RESTful, you should yeah. be getting the same result every single time. Okay. So you, that shouldn't be a concern. All right. Yeah, Ross, I'd say for the database the testing, uh, if you can make something, even if it's not an orient that simulates the results, mm -hmm. or just blow it away and run it against okay. that and recreate, that'd probably help you out. All right. So, uh, Pizza, pop. What do we want to do? Um, all right. Any, first, before that, does anybody else have any more questions about building a RESTful API? Building and consuming a RESTful API? Let's consume RESTful pizza. <laughs> Since I came in late, is there any way to see the earlier slides somehow? Yeah. Um, can you go look at them somewhere? Or? Yeah, I actually I have all my slides online. I can do a quick one through right here. Uh, so we're talking about <laughs> rest, and we're learning about the constraints of rest, and then we're taking a break, and then we're implementing rest. Is it on the meetup? Uh, it is not on the meetup, but I will put it on there. Uh, my slides, uh, the, and the, the framework itself is actually on GitHub. So if you're curious about um, actually building your own... Well, Can you go sure. back to that previous point, though? Which? Oh, okay. Gotcha. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, if you're curious about building a RESTful API, this code is all on GitHub, so you, you can consume that and, uh, you know, kind of understand a little bit more about um, building a simple RESTful API. Like I said, I wouldn't put this into production because it's really terrible, but it'll get you by and it will serve as a proof of concept to kind of uh, get you in thinking uh, in, in the way of building a RESTful API. So, any more questions before we talk about pizza? All right, and there are my links. So, um, yeah, try and click those. <laughs> so, yeah, that would be all. Thank you. So, yeah. Nice. Pizza, and then I'll, I'll order a cheese and then like a, a meat pizza or two. So, uh,